Well, uh, when we met in Qatar, it was right after the Egyptian revolution and the other things had started but hadn't really gone downhill or gotten complicated as violent as they have. So there was a lot of optimism uh, and belief in the power of a revolution to bring about that kind of social change and people thought that the internet was really going to be a key player in this. It didn't turn out to be false, but it turned out to be a lot more complicated. Uh, I was saying on a panel the other day, just as these people learn from each other around the world, the uh, dictators and governments learn from each other too. So everybody looked at Tunisia, everybody looked at Egypt, and they have learned from that. As one person told me, not in this conference, but in a previous uh, gathering, that they, that for example in Syria, they have learned that they can't be like Egypt just let internet be and they can't be like Tunisia where only Facebook was the only uncensored thing so it became a focal point for everyone uh, so they the governments have also learned how to fight back and how to use you know methods of surveillance methods of making um, and also the fact that they realize that they're fighting to the death right the, I think Tunisian uh, revolution was at first seen as a you know just a pickup, and Mubarak probably didn't believe until the end that he was a goner. So right now in Syria, Assad knows that this is it. So he is just not doing anything in a subtle way. He's just shelling lots of people and killing lots of people. In such a situation, there's not that much that the internet itself can do. Right, even if, and you don't even have open internet, you don't have free internet, even if you did, it doesn't matter. And it's not, it's, it's not even that uh, Assad has great surveillance because, I mean, over the internet, because the surveillance does matter, of course. But in this particular scenario, he doesn't even seem to care who is killing. He's just killing large numbers of people at once. And when the game is, you know, civilians being shelled with artillery, uh, the fact that they can access the internet or not is just not even uh, you know, first level consideration. But it is playing a major role even there with getting the news out. But of course, as we've seen, getting the news out, which this community is so committed to, because Global Voices is a community that is very committed, for example, to getting the word out. But there are many cases when, even if people know, it doesn't necessarily mean any action will follow from it, right? The internet is getting the word out about things, and that's important. And the more people know certain things, it makes certain kinds of action more likely that's true. But it's not inevitable. I mean, we all know what's going on in Syria, and everybody feels generally helpless. So it's getting more like mainstream media, uh, like getting the word out. And it doesn't it. even matter. You know, you can get the word out, but in the case of Syria, the getting since the Syria is not a U.S. client state. It's supported by Russia, unlike Egypt, which where U.S. had some influence. So getting the word out and pressuring the U.S. government then could have an impact. Whereas in the case of Syria, the you know activists around the world are just looking at it horrified, but they don't really seem to have a handle on what it is they could do. Also, I think this past year, this community has gone through a lot. You know, it started with the Tunisian Revolution, which was. You know, hundreds of people were killed, but it was, as these things go, you know, calmed down fairly quickly. Uh, but after Egypt, after Syria, after Bahrain, uh, after all the fighting in Libya, uh, the community of internet, online, you know, people who do most of their activism online, have gone through a lot of losses. They are people who have been arrested, people who have been killed, there are people in hiding. So there's been this really rapid, dramatic growing up experience, I think, for these communities in just one year. So they went from being the hopeless activists who were using the internet to try to talk to each other that nobody believed in, to people who had magical powers almost, it seemed, to bring down governments to a community that suffered an incredible amount of loss and also is now facing a pushback from governments around the world, their own others uh, in the form of controls, in the form of surveillance, and also when they started, they were they dominated social media often in their own countries, but not anymore. Everybody else is online. Everybody else is you know 
talking. A lot of people in Egypt have told me this. They said before the revolution, Twitter was ours. But after it, everybody's on it. So it's not like you, you're not the only people in this platform anymore. So it's gotten very complicated. It's also been a learning experience in that um, the internet is fairly good for opposing something, saying no to something unpopular. But how do you then turn that into an electoral process has never been figured out. And unite, you know, the internet is good at getting the word out around broad coalitions, like the one against Mubarak, right? It's a broad coalition. But when election time comes, it's no longer a broad coalition. It's like, what's your political party and who are you going to vote for? And, and who that, are you, how are you going to embody Yes, everything. and that kind of uh, organizing is not, was not in the experience of the, uh, especially a lot of the younger uh, activists because they they don't have they never had that kind of civic space they had never been through an open election they had never done anything of the sort so they knew how to get attention say from the world using the internet but they did not know how to mobilize and win for elections no there was this hope of that the networks would rule the world instead right. of how do you feel about that now I don't know if there was a feel that the networks, like the online networks. It was this network society. There was this whole idea about networks, there's no leaders, no we don't want any well, leaders, we want okay, networks so. to rule countries. Well, I don't really know if that was, I mean, I heard a lot about the power of the network to get things done without leaders, but even back then, these networks have some structure to them. It's just not the same kind of structure, say, as a traditional party or a labor union, but it is a structure. So these networks were never completely flat. They, you have your social media stars, you have people with varying degrees of influence. Um, so I never thought that they were leaderless. In fact, I have always argued that they are. they have a hierarchy to them. It's just not the same kind of thing that comes from having um, a traditional organization. Now, is the kind of institutional setting, institutional setup of, say, social media networks, is it suitable to running the world as it stands? Obviously not. And um, I'm just trying to think that if I even heard people argue that, I think it, it's more suitable I think people are finding out, if they already didn't know, to a broad coalition building where you're not really making a decision, all you're doing is saying no to something awful, something that a lot of people can agree on. And I think internet-based media is great for connecting people who have you know, something that they all agree on, something that's basic. But creating more complicated structures hasn't happened yet. It's more structures with, you know, how do you make decisions. Now, Global Voices, whose summit we're at, has a very explicit structure that involves making decisions. They have regional editors. They have all sorts of things that, if you look at it, there's a structure to it. What's different about them, I think, is that the structure is a lot more visible to the people inside, and the people inside are visible to each other, so they can have conversations among each other for about the structure. So that's the difference for me. So I wouldn't say these networks were flat, they just were different kind of structures and they're suited to some things and not other things. And also they're very rapidly evolving, so we'll see. Okay, last question, on a meta level, sure. because you're a professor, yes. so you think a lot about the future. I do. What will be the next step? What well, will be, I mean, I, I get a sort of a, depressed feeling almost. Well, I, okay, so I, orga I organized an academic conference along with the summit. Uh, exactly because the depressed feeling you're talking about is very common among my more activist friends uh, because they're living in the moment, right? Some uprising happens, they're euphoric, and then there's some crushing of an opposition or somebody's arrested, there's depression. Um, but in fact, if you look at it a little more historically and broadly, uh, every revolution kind of has these ups and downs. After 1848, Europe, the, the wave of revolutions, we had Napoleon. So it is not an uncommon thing for the revolutions to have this kind of ebb and flow. 
So I'm not depressed because I would be quite surprised if this was not the way it happened. You know, the, the sort of disruption that's going on in the Middle East, I think is irreversible. And in the long run, there's just no going back to what was. But that doesn't mean you can easily predict what's in the future. Well, I think what the kind of world we're stepping into is one in which if you rule based on gatekeeping, based on censorship, based on your people not being able to talk to each other, based on divide and conquer, I think such regimes are going to be massively challenged. And I, I, if I were a dictator like that, I'd be making some plans to put some money somewhere you know, in a Swiss bank account or something. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that there won't be new ways in which the powerful will push back in the new game. So my argument is that there's a new game in town and it's one of participation. The old game where you just had people unable to participate and therefore unable to coordinate and therefore you could rule them. I think that game is over. That game is historically over. Uh, but for example, if you want to compare to a historical big transformation, the printing press gravely wounded the Catholic Church, right? It was a big challenge. The printing of Bibles in vernacular languages, the eroding of authority. The Catholic Church adopted and survived. And you see this again and again with disruptions, social, socio-technical disruptions. They tend to wound power, but almost always the powerful then start adapting too. And that's what I would expect. I would expect the next wave to be every powerful institution thinking how do we deal with this disruption and the ones that want to play the game the old way I think they're gonna lose but there's gonna be ones that are gonna say what's the new game and how do we play this because there's a lot of smart people in this and I've been calling it like there's an unholy alliance I've been calling it unholy alliance of uh, Chinese political censorship Middle Eastern and other places conservatism that wants to keep out certain kinds of content off and intellectual property industries based in US and Europe that are kind of coming together to think how can we put the internet back in you know a tamer safer form there's a lot of efforts like I see something the fear every day is the fragmentation that it will be closed Right. Okay. With the, I see efforts every day. If there was a single government left sleeping about the power of the internet and the power of a connectivity revolution changing the public sphere, the Arab uprisings woke them up. They're all awake. They're all thinking and they're all coming at it. So I think for people who are kind of concerned about this, this is the time to try to think long term rather than getting depressed and happy and depressed and happy at every up and down, you really have to see that this is playing out very much like previous historical socio-technical disruptions. And the internet of the future is being shaped in these four or five years, probably, maybe a decade. And after that, it'll look like, oh, this is the way it just is. Whereas it will have been shaped in this struggle. And I think that's the coming struggle. And I think that struggle of shaping the internet is going to be as important as which country has what kind of a political system, because then that will determine what kind of avenues of participation people are going to have in the future. So I'm not depressed. I can. People should be involved in ICANN. People should be following the ITU discussions that are going to happen at the end of the year in Dubai. People should be looking at internet infrastructure and understanding what is it that makes it disruptive, the TCP IP protocol, the end-to-end -end principle, all those things that seem technical and obscure and lawyers and what's going on, but in fact are very important for uh, people to understand because this is going to be the technology that shapes our public sphere for the next however many decades and it's this upheaval that you know it'll settle down and how it's going to settle down depends on this conflict. So I'm not depressed but I never was like very euphoric that everything would be solved in a year and maybe that is because as you say I am a professor and I spend a lot of my time reading about how such things happened in the past and this is not a unique one I mean this looks like the previous historical transformation so it's not like this never happened before so we can look at that and learn a lot about that so in terms of people being connected mm -hmm. globally like yes. this hub yes. you think it will be I absolutely think people being connected will last. I mean, this has already been happening since uh, Telegraph. You know, we're, we've been connected more and more Telegraph to radio to telephone. 
and this is a genuinely connective technology. This the way it is. Is that I mean, look at this. We have 60 countries, 300 languages. It just never could have happened 10 years ago. This is globalization from below. We had globalization from above for all of 20th century. They met in Davos, but you had to, you know, they had their own organizations. They had their internal networks. They had their ways of meeting with each other. And for the first time, the globalization can happen from below too. And I think it's absolutely here to stay. And uh, to me, that's a good thing. And more participation is here to stay. Now, to me, that's a complicated thing because more participation does not necessarily mean more human rights, more democracy, it just means more participation. So quite frankly, I'm waiting for the first big ethnic cleansing aided by social media. It's going to happen. I tell people, it's, it's going to happen. I mean, people, whenever there's awful things, people use whatever tools they have, and they are going to use social media to organize awful things as well. There's no rule that says you can only, you know, organize, use social media to organize good things. People can come to, because participation means whatever's on the ground gets amplified. These are technologies of amplification. And what they amplify depends on what's already on the ground. So if polarization, ethnic hatred's on the ground, they're going to amplify that. Um, That's true. And when I was in the meeting of the shadow thing, the shadow he said, so Facebook is as good as my friends are. That's basically yeah. it. Right. Thank that you so much. Sense. Thank you.